Welcome to ACCA F9 paper, Financial Management. Today we're going to talk about the cost of capital, which is really the core of corporate finance, corporate finance theory, and is quite important in paper F9. Now the important concepts in order to make this um, part of the paper intelligible is to keep in mind that uh, there is a res relationship between risk and return. The higher the risk of a project is, the higher the return, expected return should be from the project. We're assuming that a rational investor is making investment choices. We also should uh, take note at this point of the notion of risk-free rate, which would be the rate which should be uh, earned uh, by making a safe investment that has no credit risk involved, but where the compensation is uh, to the investor is to cover the rate of inflation, i.e. to preserve the purchasing value of one's money. Now, the important thing in uh, determining the cost of capital is to consider equity separately from debt, and there are two ways to, or possibly more, but the two ways which are covered in the paper F9 in approaching the cost of equity is to use the dividend discount model and to um, extract what a cost of equity could be based on the expected dividend streams, uh, dividend stream given by a particular share. So if the dividend discount model, uh, we need to have dividends in order to be able to uh, extract or to uh, figure out what the implied cost of equity is. The uh, formula is adjusted for the possibility of growth in the dividend going forward. That's denoted by G. And G can be determined Historically, if we look back at past dividends to see what the uh, compounded growth rate has been, as the example here demonstrates. Now, there's another approach that we can take to determining the cost of equity, and that is to uh, build up the cost, um, starting with the risk-free rate, and to add slices of risk and therefore the returns that should be uh, required by an investor for accepting a higher level of risk. The cost of equity in this way can be um, summarized in the capital asset pricing model in which we have at our, we anchor it on the risk-free rate and to the risk-free rate we add a risk premium which is represented by the additional uh, return that's required when we invest in equity. And this parenthetic part of the equation, Rm minus Rf, captures precisely the difference between the expected rate of return that we would uh, want from, a invest from investing in a diversified portfolio of shares above and beyond the risk-free rate itself. And finally, for a specific share, in order to determine what the cost of equity would be associated with that particular share, we need to make a final adjustment on this parenthetic uh, risk, what is known as the risk uh, <coughs> market risk premium. We need to make a further adjustment using beta which is capturing the systematic risk of a specific share. In other words, capturing the degree to which its share price fluctuates relative to the market as a whole. So the beta is, is a measure of sensitivity of, the, of a particular share to the uh, movements of the stock market as a whole. So if the if the share is more volatile than the market as a whole, the beta is going to be greater than one. Now, the nice thing about the capital asset pricing model is that it's quite easy to use. If we know what the beta is, we know what the uh, 
risk-free rate is, and we know what the market risk premium is or the expected return on the uh, investing in a diversified uh, portfolio of shares, then we can determine what the cost of equity will be for a particular share. Um, in this case, one has a numerical exercise which uh, illustrates this quite nicely. Now, we said at the beginning that higher risk requires a higher return to the investor for investing in a particular kind of instrument. When we look at other capital instruments, therefore, we can also determine, based on observation of market prices, what the uh, corresponding cost of a particular instrument is. Let's take uh, preference shares, for example. Preference shares will pay, let's assume that the shares are irredeemable, and therefore we can use a perpetuity formula. If we know what the dividend payable is on the preference share, we can divide it by the market price of the share, and we will extract our cost of percentage cost or percentage required return on preference shares. If the preference shares are redeemable, then we need to take the uh, dividends over the period uh, during which they will be paid, and we need to discount back or find the discount rate at which the, the preference uh, dividends will be equal to the market price of the of the uh, preference share and in this way we will be able to extract by solving for kp this is a trial and error um, exercise when when determining this effectively we're looking for an internal rate of return and in doing this we can determine what the uh, required investor rate of return is for investing in preference shares and it goes on when we the same idea applies to uh, debt instruments as well if we have uh, a bond issue for example which has a certain uh, redemption date in the future then we simply need to um, calculate what the irr of the uh, bond cash flows are going to be this or this can be any kind of loan the, as long as we know what the periodic payments have to be of uh, interest and what the redemption value is going to be. So again, the mathematics are very straightforward and uh, just applied to different types of instruments. If we have irredeemable debt, in other words, if it's per perpetual debt, then again, it becomes very easy. We simply have to, uh, we can determine the cost of debt by dividing the interest paid on the debt by its uh, market price. Um, until now, we haven't mentioned taxes, but of course, we have to take into account taxes when we are calculating the cost of debt to a company because the company's interest payments are tax deductible and therefore tax is a very relevant um, factor to take into account. Let's look at an example here. So if a company is issuing a bond and it has to pay 4% on the bond, that would be the coupon rate, then, and uh, tax rate is 35%, then we can say that the company, the payment of the 4% can be adjusted by the after-tax calculation to determine what the effective cost of borrowing is for the company. In this case, we can see that the cost of debt to the company is 2.74%. So remember, take into account the tax savings, which are or tax relief, which is available to a company which is borrowing. Here's another example. This is a bond with these uh, conditions as shown here. Um, we need to determine what the current value, the market value of the bond is. And the answer lies in mapping out the cash flows of the bond 
And if we know that the current yield is uh, 6%, in other words, the current yield required by lenders is 6%, we need to we need to discount by the cash by 6%, the cash flows in order to determine what the market value of the bond is. And from the company's point of view, we can say that the cost of debt is 4.47% because that will be the uh, that would be a result of determining what the IRR rate is of the cash flows by equating the market value with the discount rate at which the future cash flows uh, are equal to the market value. Notice here that in the first case, we're calculating the um, cash flows uh, using $5 million, which is the cash flows representing 5% coupon rate. This is based on a required return of 6% to the investor. When we're talking about the cost of debt from the company's point of view, we need to take the coupon payments on an after-tax basis. This is the difference essentially from up here. And we're working out what the effective uh, cost of debt is, the IRR of the cash flows based on the market value of the debt set off against its after-tax payments of interest and, of course, the redemption value of the, of the bond. Now, the next important step in the determination of the cost of capital for a company is to take the combinations of equity and debt and combine them in the, what is called the weighted average cost of capital. Very important um, concept in corporate finance because this weighted average cost of capital is effectively the discount rate the company uses in order to evaluate future projects in its line of business. The uh, D and the E in the formula is would be the amounts of debt and equity taken at their market values, not at their nominal values and the assumptions or the uh, conditions for using the company's own WAC is if it's uh, looking at a project in its own business line and therefore the business risk doesn't change and provided the capital structure of the company does not change as a result of uh, entering into the or, or doing the project in other words the financial risk also does not change the capital structure theories have been addressed by two gentlemen called Modigliani and Miller, and it is suggested that students uh, look uh, at carefully at the arguments which were made. This is more of uh, passing interest, but it's quite useful to understand uh, the implications of capital structure based on the uh, theories uh, that were developed by Miller and Modigliani. both uh, propositions one and two. It's, uh, it adds insight into our appreciation of what capital structure does uh, for a company. Thank you.